And also something else which has been very important in the work is to see how uh, the uh, East India Company, and I would keep saying East India Company and not colonial power, the East India Company had an administration, a bureaucracy, which established itself through practices. Uh, it did with the bureaucracy, uh, and the way the practices were put in place in each particular region, locality, is formed into governing qualities and particular sovereign, sovereign self-regulation. So I'll get back to this. Um, I think we need to look at uh, the region also a little from outer space, as you can see in this map. Uh, the northeastern frontier had a larger context uh, in the early uh, in the European mercantile corporations trade in Asia, and also in the European nation states' ambitions to get in control of the uh, corporations. They were not in control of the company, so it was not an expansion of European states on Asian soil, but of corporations. Um, and uh, obviously, what you see in this blue line is uh, the connection between Bengal and Macau, a very important trading route. Uh, and to be in control and monopolize this trade route was uh, one of the core issues for the, for the company. This means that the time frame of the study is very important. It is from the granting of the privileges to the territories uh, in uh, Bengal, uh, that which was called the Diwani territory. Uh, and I round it up as in the 1830s, which is when the British East India Company loses its last monopoly, which was the monopoly on tea and the China trade. Um, so uh, the trade, uh, today, when, when all this is discussed, I think we need to remind ourselves, it is often represented as an enclosed entity. It, as you know, maps of India make the Northeast look like an appendix almost cut off or just tied with this tiny chicken neck uh, connecting it to the so-called mainland India. The, the terminology needs to be thought through many times, I think. It's carried also heavy colonial visits into the present. Now this secluded position of the region has a comparatively short history. Uh, it is the interest in mineral wealth of the hill and of connecting Bengal and India with a large market in China that was the major driving force behind the company's advance eastward across territory. So commercial prosperity, private uh, returns pushed the company initiative to establish control of the territories, which they argued, because they had to argue that they were included in the D1 abroad, because the D1 gave them legal rights to these territories. Uh, the company did, uh, therefore not want to fill off the northeast, but they want to reopen the commercial overland route uh, to the east. Now there is a map uh, which I wish I could have shown you, but I cannot. It's in the collections of the Survey of India here in Delhi in the National Archives. So I'm trying to describe this map to you because it summarizes in a very good way some of, of the very core issues I think which are at stake here when we are to understand uh, this particular situation. The map is called the Northeastern Frontier with Burma and part of China, and it's from 1862. Uh, here within the red frames you can see uh, the boundaries of the map. So it's anything but this map of India. It's a map which cuts across the regions that we generally associated with maps of, of uh, India. In the southwest corner, you will find Calcutta. And if you move along the western boundary up north, you will move west of Bhutan into Tibet, uh, up to the Namso or the Tengri North Celestial Lake. Moving east along the northern boundary, you will move into Sichuan in China. And then south, you cut through Yunnan. Most of Yunnan is inside the map. Into Upper Laos, and then you turn west at the southern boundary of Burma, south of Amrapura in Burma, across the Bay of Bengal and back to Mount Here you have the outer boundaries of this map in 1862. Uh, I think we need to remind ourselves that there doesn't exist a map which is an image of reality. Every map shows an image of what someone wants to say about reality. There is a map maker, and this map maker has an idea of what it is 
what, what is to be conveyed uh, in the map. Uh, so you have the boundaries here. Everything inside is important, and that which is left outside is considered less important. There is a story to tell you. There is only a center of the map, the geographical center, and that center is Manipur. Manipur and Akhtarasan is the center of this map. Uh, if you see the map, it's very large, uh, and it's peppered with place names. But they are not even distressed. Uh, if you look at the place names, they look like ant parts. So you have a long stretch, you have a lot of names. And then another, another part and a lot of names. And another part and a lot of names. And the reason why they are there is because they are derived from um, the terrain maps of the 1820s and 30s. And so when you look at the uh, maps from the 20s and 30s, which are really little maps, and you can see how they've been making corrections, and they've seen something on the map, and they've been made on tour as the surveyors have traveled, then you can detect all these little maps in the large map. So they, it's a combination. Uh, also, in between these so-called ant parts are empty spaces. Not because there were no places there, but because the British hadn't been put there, so they didn't know these places. However, the map is water covered very deeply water, a little dark in those years. Uh, but you can see that someone has made very nice topographical water coming in.